very excited to be here. I'm going to take the next 20 minutes for you guys to talk about your way out of the dark. So uh, let's get started. Good. You see all these uh, great quotes, these great Hollywood stories about these fantastic companies that just suddenly found a way to actually grow triple digits, found like this amazing growth hack that just like took them out there. I think all these stories are quite useless. I think all these stories are quite useless because when you are not at that stage that these companies are, which most of us are not, what they do cannot really be applied. These guys are at a different stage. These guys are not beyond the wall, and yes, I am a big Game of Thrones fan. So these guys are still in King's Landing having a good time, right? They know their ICP, they know their channels, they know their CAC, they know their LTV. They got this pretty much sorted. They're running a machine. They can do A-B testing. You cannot do that when you're still pre-product market fit because you probably won't have the traffic. So what are, you, what are you gonna do when you're there? When you're still beyond the wall, you're running around in darkness practically, you don't have this clear sight of your customers of exactly like what metrics to focus on. You need to, you need to apply different measures, you need to do something different, right? And who am I to tell you about this? Um, I'm Simon, I'm a co-founder of the Startup Studio Founders. We're based in, out of Copenhagen and Berlin. We practically build companies, we practically act as co-founders every day within B2B SaaS work tools. We build companies together with exceptional entrepreneurs that go on and become the co-founders of these companies. We focus on the first 18 to 24 months and just keep grinding that period because that is the period that is like most interesting for us to play with. This is where like there's so many unknowns and this is where we really believe we can put things on a process and by that increase chances of success. We have existed for five years. We've built 15 plus tools and companies. So I've been working with these companies every day, co-founding these companies, being acting as growth advisor on these companies, and really been trying to figure out how do we create more light on this path towards product market fit, when you don't know where you're going. And all these learnings we gather on one platform, so we are a team of 25, we have a growth team of five people, and all these learnings keep like brewing on the platform. So that's why I believe that I have something to say around this stage and how we get to product market fit and post product market fit. So this will not be another story for you about this amazing growth hack that led us to 1 million ARR or this way of doing it that, meant, that came us to this milestone of 10K MRR or how, whatever it might be. This will be a story about the mistakes that we did and the learnings that came out of it and the frameworks that we are applying today in order not to do those mistakes again. So these are frameworks that everybody can apply in their own kind of way, but these are frameworks that are quite general, and it's just about sitting down and working with these frameworks. And this is a way like, that we came out on top today and avoid doing these mistakes every day. I'll start talking about the first framework, which will be distribution research, an incredibly powerful way of going about understanding your competitors, your peers, and how they distribute, how they get traffic. Then we'll move on to growth machine, which is a way for us to simply just help us with the focus, which is the issue of all, I believe, especially early stage companies, when everything is a mess, is about focus. And then it's about the discipline from the growth memos. But before I go there, before I start on the first mistake learning framework, let me just like, give a bit of perspective on how I see this pre-product market fit growth. Any of you know where this picture is coming from? It's a Tupperware party. So it's a Tupperware party back in the US in the 60s where a company figured out that their main channel was actually to go into people's private homes and sell their products. I'm just like, how the hell do you figure that out? And that just, I think, shows one of the main points that I want to make, how much distribution and product just are interlinked. You cannot separate these two things. And that's why you need to work with distribution and product already at the pre-product market fit stage. From the beginning, you need to start testing about how do people put for, how do people um, perceive your product when you position it like this? How do they perceive it when you distribute it to this channel? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is so important. And it's so important because the way that you need to 
go about this is to keep insisting on understanding why. The only way that you can get to the point that you really understand how your distribution channel fit with your product is if you keep insisting on understanding why. And that's what these frameworks will help you with, I believe, what these frameworks are helping what us with every day. That is to understand why. I don't care whether or not your growth experiment, your distribution tactic is a failure or success, but I care about whether or not you understood why it was a failure or a success. It can be a failure, and you can understand why it was a failure, and you can actually go to a better place, right? Good. I got that off my chest. So first mistake we did was very much to just to jump in the ocean. One of our companies, which is actually quite successful today, luckily, is, is Duo, um, people management platform. Um, we started out by just going out there and testing. And that's good. We all like testing, right? But there was just something there that kind of like didn't really feel right. A lot of the other companies that we were competing with peers were all also in these channels. They had better budgets, they had better brand, and we were really struggling here. So the learning that we did from this was really to make sure that you always sharpen your axe before you start cutting down the tree. And I really cannot stress this enough. This is about preparing yourself before you go out there. And the way we're going to do that very practically is through this framework that we call distribution research. It's quite simple, actually. It's simply just like looking into how your peers and competitors distribute their product. And you can do that quite effectively if you actually start using some of these tools that I've put down here. I especially want to um, underline Ahrefs and similar web. These are tools that can actually help you understand where your competitors and peers are getting their traffic from. Is it paid? Is it organic? Is it email? Is it referral? You can even see where they're getting like, their top five referral traffic from. You can even see what kind of content they're sharing and what kind of content is performing the best. You can even see the keyword difficulty on some of the long-term searches on a, on, on a search engine. And you can even see how, 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 what, what kind of content you should build in order to get up there. This can be incredibly powerful. This will not serve you the silver bullet on a plate, for sure. But it will give you a really, really strong insight into what is already out there. Where should I go? Where should I not go? And get that kind of like perception before you start your first growth activities. All right. Next mistake. <laughs> so what about this one, right? We all, I think we've all been there, and I'm, I'm still there every day. It's just like, oh, I just heard about these guys at SaaS Talk. They're doing podcasts. It's amazing. They're working perfectly for them. Oh, what about these guys? They did this insane side product, and now they're just like skyrocketing. It's amazing. Oh, what about these guys? They're doing why, 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 why. And it's, we always find ourselves in this annoying space where you just get new ideas and just start working on something else, right? And that's the worst thing you can do, especially when you're pre-product market fit. You need to have that kind of like focus and you need to work really, really structured with your growth activities. So as The Rock says, it's all about focus, right? And how do you do that? So yes, thank you, Simon. Focus, great. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. So we do this by applying what we call growth machine. Growth Machine is simply a tool for us to help us keep reminding ourselves, okay, Simon, is this important to do now? Should I really be doing this right now? Or should I rather just stick to what I'm doing already? So it's quite simple. We have a backlog. That's where we put all the ideas in that we get randomly. Don't start working on them. Don't start doing anything. Just put them in the backlog. Score them really quickly. What is the cost? What is the potential results? What kind of challenge do we expect? this activity to evolve around, et cetera, et cetera. That's it. Then the next stage is really, really the, the core of the growth machine. This is an experiment doc. So then maybe like bi-weekly at our growth meetings, we look at our backlog. We see, okay, we have, we have room on our plate. We maybe start doing something else. What do we have up there? And in order to suggest something at the growth meetings, or in order to even like start on something, you write an experiment document. You write an experiment document, which is basically what is the objective, what is the, what is the hypothesis of this growth activity, what is the experiment design, what is the expected cost, what is the expected results, and you just write these things down. It's a half pager, it's a one pager. It's really, it, you, it takes 10 minutes, but it just like keeps you reflect a bit on, is this really important for me to do right now? And why should I be doing this? And also amazing way to actually communicate to the rest of the team, this is what I want to do. It's amazing how clear things become when you actually write things down. And even better, when you hire your next growth marketeer that comes in and say, why don't we do this thing? 
well, we've already done it, and you can read about it in this experiment document. Let's work on what we have in our pipeline right now, which is where we put our promoted experiments that we've all decided this is what we're working on right now. So experiment documents, incredibly powerful, really good at communicating, and super good for keeping a base, a storage, a, a brain of all your growth experiments in order for you to learn and understand why as a started up by saying. And I think this also comes a bit back to, to, to one of my other main points is that I really like the whole concept of testing, yes, but I just think there's a key element of testing cannot be like replacement for actually doing research and actually being structured. Sometimes it's just like, I'm just testing. Well, what are you testing and why are you testing it? And that's why we need to keep pounding on this part about having a process and being really structured because especially pre-product market fit, it's just a mess. You're already like two points behind, right? That takes me into my number three and my last mistake learning and framework. So we've all been there and I'm here every day struggling with discipline, right? I'm struggling with myself about discipline. And this is again about building a process. So I'm not here to preach like a new, a new, um, a new growth hack, a new bullet, a new silver bullet. I'm here to preach that you have this process and you really follow it. And I'm giving you some frameworks that can help you follow it just a bit better. That's basically it. So as Obama also obviously um, believe in is the power of writing things down. The power of writing things down is amazing. Again, if you write things down, it becomes so much more clear. And if you write things down, you actually become accountable to it. And that's why we work with growth memos. So in those growth meetings that I referred to back before, we actually have like a document that simply just states what is our North Store right now and what, what, how, is it, how is it going, one, one KPI. What is the last sprint focus? What are the last sprint agreements? Following up on that, how are, how are we, where are we on this one? And what is the next sprint focus and next sprint agreements? And we write these things down. It is super, super simple, but it's just, if you don't have these frameworks and you don't like make this part of your culture, it's just so easy to, 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 to get away from. And it's just gonna kill your business if you don't have the structure. Or I believe that it can help you a lot more if you actually follow the structure. So this was the three pillars of Founders Growth Model, the distribution research, the growth machine, and the growth memo. Um, all these frameworks uh, we have written about on our blog uh, on Medium, Founders Blog on Medium, Founders Field Notes, it's, call, it's called. Um, and we also have actually a specific blog universe for all our growth learnings called growth.founders.as. Um, so you're more than welcome to go in there. There's actually also links into some of the templates that I showed you here that you can just like get down on a Google Doc and just copy it and you can make it yours. And I'm not here to say that you need to follow this as I'm doing it, as we're doing it. You need to make it your own, but here there's at least like a starting point for you to go about the whole pre-product market fit where we all just need to like find some light out there and cling on to it because that's our only road up to the product market fit that we're all chasing. That's it. We actually have uh, five minutes left, so if there's any questions, I'm more than willing to take uh, questions. Yeah? Will you say again? I missed it. Will you say again real quick, what were your favorite distribution research tools? You've, yeah. I wanted to catch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, AH refs. So it's an A and an H and the refs, um, and then similar web are the two main ones, especially the refs. They, they, of course, have like a freemium model where you get a bit of insight without paying and then you need to pay, but they're like really powerful. I would say like you need, I, I can look at my own uh, analytics and I can see the stats that they provide. It's not always like 100% correct, but again, it just gives you a bit of an idea about like, okay, where's this industry going? Are everybody getting their traffic from organic? Are everybody getting their traffic from emails? Are everybody getting their blah, blah, blah? It's really, really powerful for content. You can really, really look deep into the keyword difficulty on a specific keyword and how easy it is for, 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 for you to rank on that keyword on your organic uh, content, on your SEO content. Super powerful. Yeah. Early adopters often have different needs than l later clients. Yeah. So how, how do you deal with that? Like getting good feedback that's um, representative and not just 
biased in, in, yeah. in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very good point. Like, I think for sure, like, early adopters have indeed definitely, you mean the clients that you get on? Yes, yes. Um, so we deal with that as, as I think uh, most of us know, like there's this uh, famous book, like the mom test, and there's like these different ways of going about customer discovery. Like it's very much a part about like um, ensuring that we get the, the honest uh, answer and whether or not they actually want to pay. We try to, depending on the different business models, of course, but we try to push the pay, um, the, the, the turning on the, uh, the, the revenue as soon as possible in order because that is like just the, that is the most clear answer you can get from people. Are they willing to pay for it? Of course, right? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons for also why we really believe in this platform approach because when you're building a company on a platform approach, I think we, we hedge the risk a bit and somebody can argue that that hedging of risk is not always healthy because you want people that have blood and sweat and everything into it. I fully agree with that. But you also want people that can see and that can like listen. And if you're sometimes too deep into a rabbit hole, you cannot listen. So that's very much like what we're preaching on, on the founders platform that is like, well, if this doesn't work, you need to do something else, right? And I think also back to the, the, the talk that was just before, like if, if they don't respond on four emails and you're just selling for free, there's something wrong here, right? Other question, yeah. You've given us a lot of insight on how to, to work on getting a market fit, but how do you define reaching the goal of getting a market fit? Yes. I would love if I had a straight answer on that uh, because I think then when I would make a lot of money. Uh, I think we're all struggling to know exactly what product market fit is and I think also I perceive it, I, I view it as a way that you can get to product market fit and then you can actually lose it again. I think for sure you can, you can get more product and you can lose it. Um, so I think for, for, for some B2B SaaS companies, I think for sure like the 10K MR is, is, is one, one concept of it. Of course, if you get that from three clients, it's not really. Um, but, but, but I still think that that, that way of, of thinking about it can be one thing. Another thing is of course like the activity inside your product. Um, and, but, but I think it very depends on the, on the key KPI that you're defining for yourself, which will differ from company to company and should differ from company to company. And, and, and that's what you should, what you should look for. Um, but I believe that, that, that again, it, it, you, you can feel it. Um, I think some say it's very, very obvious when, when you get it, when you have it. Um, I don't, I don't fully agree. I think it's, it's, there's different ways of, of, of getting it. Um, but, but I still think you, can, you, you, you start to, to build the confidence. You know when you have it, you know when you, do, when you don't have it, I think for sure. And, and I think you should always question if you think you have it. Other questions? Good. Thank you. <laughs>